Good evening and welcome. Bethel is an inclusive faith community seeking to transform lives by exemplifying the unconditional love of Jesus. We extend a cordial and heartfelt welcome to all who join us in worship today in person, via Zoom, or live stream. Welcome to those new to the Christian faith, those who are longtime followers of Christ, as well as those who are just curious about faith in Christ. To our friends who are without a church home and to those visiting with friends and family from another faith community. To those who need strength, want to follow Jesus Christ, have doubts, or do not yet believe. To people of every color, culture, sexual orientation, gender identification, economic background, age, size, ability, and challenges, old friends and new guests. To the old and the young, believers and questioners and questioning believers, we welcome you to worship God with us on this day. I have a couple of announcements. The Joy of Christmas Fiesta will be held this coming Saturday, December 9th. That passed. It was a success, by the way. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Mylene. I'll skip to the next paragraph then. Um, ELCA Good Gifts. Did you know that the ELCA has a similar program to World Vision and the Heifer International, where your contributions go to enable food and financial sustainability by providing the resources and training required to people all around the world. There are catalogs here in the chapel you can take home or go to goodgifts.elca.org to see the wide variety of options you have to change lives. Give someone in need some seeds, a mosquito net, some honey bees, a flock of chicks, a goat, or even a cow. Change a life. As always, info is available in the Bethel Light. Thank you. So today is the second Sunday in Advent, and we light the second candle. For Christians, the season of Advent began this past Sunday four weeks leading to the birth of Jesus, intended to be a contemplative time for Christians. Let us join together in today's Advent prayer. Light of the world, in grace and beauty, mirror of our God's eternal face, transparent flames of love, free duty, you bring salvation to our human race. Sacred mystery, we light the second advent candle for hope and truth. We kindle it with hope. We long for you to come to our world, to break through and reign with compassion, justice, and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carl, for bringing forth the cross. Please join us in singing praise. It's a new one, but we've done it once before, so. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the My praise is a weapon, it's 
to our living God who makes a way where no way is seen. I know you'll come through. This mountain is moving. I fix my You said it, you'll do it. Because you are God, no matter the odds, the outcome is always the same. The words on the pages, the promise you made us, still have the final say. You will make a way. Always make Cause you're already in it. My hope and my future is already written. Because you are God, no matter the odds, the outcome is always the same. The words on the pages, the promise you made us. You'll have the final say
a scripture reading, Matthew 2. I'm just not going to say that. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, I don't know, uh, my guy, the, from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and has come to worship him. When King Herod heard his this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, people's chiefs, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah who was to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you will come a ruler who, is, who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi, sec- Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may t- too may go and worship him. After that they have heard the king, They went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented with him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they would turn to their country by another route. (laughs) I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, there's so many voices that call for our attention. And so many that would tell us what we need to do with our lives. So please give us the wisdom to hear the still small voice that guides us. Amen. Amen. How many of you have ever read Robert Frost's uh, Road Less Traveled? Probably most of us. I shall tell thee, I shall be telling thee this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one least traveled by. And that has made all the difference. We can't really decide what happens around us each day, but we can decide how we go through each day. In the second chapter of Matthew, we find the story of the three wise men. Now, many jokes have been told about the three wise men, especially connected to that that line in that song, Do You Hear What I Hear?, which says, A child, a child shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Well, (laughs) Well, the joke goes that... After the three wise men left their gold, frankincense, and myrrh, three more intelligent women came, (laughs) and they were carrying a month's supply of baby formula, a cooked casserole for the entire family, and three months' supply of diapers. In her book, um, in her children's book, uh, the Reverend Barbara... Brown Taylor, it, I mean, she is just an amazing Episcopal priest and a preacher. I mean, and I don't say that about a lot of preachers, but she is just an amazing preacher. In her children's book, she tells the story of the three wise men this way. So just listen for one second. Upon, once upon a time, there were three very wise men, and they were sitting in their countries, minding their own business, when a bright star landed in the right eye of each one of them. The star was so bright that none of them could tell whether it was burning in the sky or their imagination. But they were wise enough to know it didn't really matter much. The point was something beyond them was calling them, and it was a tug they had been waiting for all their lives. Each in his own country had 
tried books and magic and even astrology. One had lived on nothing but dried herbs, uh, boiled water. Uh, another had spent his entire fortune learning to read and write in the ancient language. The third had learned to walk on hot coal, though it did not nothing for him beyond the great relief he felt at the end. Despite their best effort, all three of them felt something was really missing. They were all glad for a reason to get out of town, which was clearly where the star was calling them. Out from everything they knew how to manage. Out from everything they knew how to survive. Out from under the reputations they had built for themselves. The high expectations, the disappointing returns. And so they set out one day, one by one, believing that he was the only one with a star in his eyes. Until they all ran into each other on the road to Jerusalem. From a distance, each thought the other to be a mirage at first and a sparkling reflection made of vapor and of heat. But as they drew near, they saw what they had in common, the star. Like a tattoo or a secret handshake, something that made them brothers before they even spoke. They all believed that the star was leading them to Jerusalem. This made perfect sense because they had every reason to think they were on their way to meeting a king. In addition to knowing what not to bring a newborn baby and their family, I think there are a few things that we can learn from the journey of the three wise men. And I just want to share a couple of them with you tonight. For one thing, there's a great wisdom in seeing the signs that point another way. But there's also great wisdom in being willing to follow those signs whenever we see them. Those who, through experience and training, have learned the signs of the marketplace, you know, the Dow Jones. They can deal more effectively with the changes that happen in our economy. When, when we listen, and this is for all of us, when we listen to our bodies and we seek the medical help that we need or take the rest that we so desperately need, uh, it can help us when we pay attention to the signs in our bodies. When we, we pay attention to the signs around us, even though we have 70 degrees probably 90% of the time here in Los Angeles, California, when we pay attention to the signs, we can, we can know what to expect in the weather. Have you heard this little poem? Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Maybe through years of study, searching the heavens or using GPS, God's positioned star, the three wise men finally found something worth following. Have you found something worth following? Don't answer yet. They knew the sign when they saw it, and they had the confidence and have the courage to follow it. What about you and me? Have you found something that you have the confidence and the courage to follow? Another thing that speaks to me from the story is that they were open to new ideas. What about you and me? Are we open to new ideas? The usual barriers of inconvenience and risk, at least when my reading, did not appear to stop these three wise men. Have you ever remain behind the borders and the barriers instead of opening up your life to new possibilities? Have you ever remained behind the borders and the barriers instead of opening your life to new possibilities? I have. The truth is, we can become settled and comfortable where we need to be open and ready to move. Have you heard the cute little joke? Passenger was sitting in the airplane, content and relaxed, headphones on, reclined in the seat, when a woman appeared to him with a parachute. 
And she asked, would, would you like to join me? Oh, no, thanks, said the passenger. I'm thrilled where I'm at. And the woman turned to him and said, uh, you do as you like. I'm the pilot. <laughs> you all will get that when you get home. <laughs> Sometimes it's tempting and possibly even more accessible to crouch down in the shadows of our little world and feel lonely and frightened rather than to look beyond the walls beyond the walls of nations, beyond the walls of race, beyond the walls of denomination, beyond the walls of age and gender, beyond the walls of position, and see the star that is calling you and me, calling us to a new life, calling us to some new ideas, calling us to new ways of seeing and new ways of being, calling us to new ways of living and new ways of giving. Think of the contrast that is found in the scriptures. The priests and the scribes, they couldn't see the obvious. They were the ones who should have known, but they were behind the walls. They were behind the walls of institution. They were behind the walls of establishment. They lacked the boldness and the faith and the courage to find a new way. Herod himself couldn't see it either. He hides behind the wall of power in our text. And at a point of decision, he hid behind the barriers, scheming on how to save his power. We see that today in politics. In this moment of terror, it terrorized Bethlehem at the birth of Jesus. But the wise men, on the other hand, they didn't stay behind the walls. They didn't stay behind the walls that sometimes divide you and me. They, they followed the star, reaching out to others when their wisdom would take them no further. They followed the star. But even as they reached their goal, they had to be open to following and going in a new direction. They had to be ready to follow where they were being led. How tempting it is to run back to security. You know, you start that eating program or exercise program. You say, I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and I'm going to meditate or I'm going to go on a walk. And the first three days of the new year it goes. But by the time we get to January 4th, it's tempting to go back to the security of our little corner. How attractive it might be and it might have been to shift the responsibility, these three wise men to shift the responsibility and even to rationalize them to report back to Herod because that's what Herod told them to do. Instead of going another way, that's how the verse ends, they went another way. And that's the title of my message today, Going Another Way. When those in power tell us one way, love and grace and mercy and God seem sometimes to be leading us another way, which path do you take? Which path do I take? When, when we come to that crossroad where we have to make a decision, how do you make decisions? Which paths do you take? I'm reminded of the words of Howard Thurman, one of my favorite writers. In his book, Meditation of the Heart, he says, sometime in the stillness of the quiet, if we listen, we can hear the whisper in the heart giving strength to weakness, giving courage to fear, and giving hope to despair. Did the wise men stumble onto the star? That star that caught their eye, how did they make the connection with the star? 
Did, did they happen to have the, the, the spirituality or maturity to discern that God wanted them to ignore what the king had commanded them to do? Go find out about this child and then come back and tell me. I think it was the ability to see the star and know God's guidance that helped the wise man go another way. And so we too, you and me, I'm, I'm struggling with this, need to be disciplined in our study, need to be disciplined in our study of scripture, in our study of people. I am, um, I am a self-proclaimed people watcher. I love watching people. And I study people. And, and one of my mentors told me once, you know what you need to do with your children? You need to go to school on your children. You need to study them so you can learn who they are and get to know who they are and how, what their proclivities are and how they react to when you say something or when they say something, whether you're listening to them. You need to go to school. I, 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 in our study of people, in our study of law, in our study of politics, in our study of policies and systems, if we hope to discern God's will in our lives, we have to begin those kind of studies. I'm not talking about, um, like, um, <laughs> I'll leave that alone. <laughs> we have to begin those studies if we hope to be guided in, in God's way. We, we, we got to be disciplined because wisdom, I don't know that wisdom comes from a closed mind. And so we need on this journey in life not to merely just wait. We need to seek and that's what I'm doing. We need to seek. In doing so, challenge the vested interests of the world and even of our hearts sometimes. What was my heart telling me? Or what was the heart of those three wise men telling them? Listen to Herod or listen to the direction that this star is taking them? One writer wrote these words and I struggled with as I, as I was preparing the message. We are all... So much together, yet we're dying of loneliness. So many in the world today are way, walled off, walled off from each other. Before it even arrives, we feel Christmas fading away. I think that's one of the things I struggle most with Christmas, is that this big ramp up to it, and then whew, this fall off, you know? We start preparing for Christmas since October, and it's like, <sighs> push. before it even arrives, sometimes it feels like it's fading away. That, that time of, of friendliness, that time of warmth, that time of care, that time of togetherness. We observe the seasons, but we don't expect them to change. We hide behind walls. And so we're afraid of the journey and not hoping anything will change. We hide behind walls. The wise man could have claimed, well, the king told us, go find out and then come back. We're merely visitors in this land. It's the regulation of this land. And our first task was to make sure that our caravan was safe. So we're just doing what the king told us to do. They could have said that. In Luke's gospel, the quiet Christmas slips away if you read it. No longer a whisper, no longer limited to a few sh shepherds, but now in the halls of power. That's where Christmas occurs. The very foundation of power is being shaken by the decision that these wise men are making. King Herod feels threatened. And if I were giving a stage direction, I might say something like this. Exit shepherds and enter the wise men. Exit stable and enter the palace. The lullaby is to be replaced with the wailing and the crying of the women whose children are being slaughtered just because this Herod feels threatened. 
The text in Matthew tells us that it was not only Herod, but all of Jerusalem that was frightened because of his actions. Have you ever noticed how cities become symbols for entire nations? Cities become symbols for entire ideologies? We hear on the news, London said this, and Washington is planning this, and Israel is worried about this. In Matthew's account, an entire faith is being challenged to an awakening of the day. And we discover again the truth that not everybody will love you. Even the good news has its enemies. The good news of the birth of the king or the the Messiah, even the good news has its enemies. Others have other plans. There are those whose selfish interest is being challenged. Herod's. And some people just don't want to change. The challenge is if we find the way we believe God is taking us on, we're challenged to stay on that path. In his book, The Culture of Disbelief, I actually had the pleasure of meeting um, Stephen Carter when he was a professor at Yale University. He quotes a, a, a well-known historian named Bryce, and he said, the more the church identifies with the world, the further it departs from its own best self. What are we called to be and do as a church? What are we called to be and do as a faith community? The church expected or professed to be Christianizing the world, but it seems to me sometimes, and, and don't this is not some broad view of what world means, but it just the hatred and the, the violence and the whether you call it racism or anti-Semitism, that is in the world is creeping even into the Christian faith. You talk to people and they're like, oh, I love my love up to here. I love these people. I don't like these people. What are we doing? If these three wise men had listened to Herod, the wise men would have found their journey and themselves changed. But they remain faithful. They remain faithful to the one who had placed a star in the sky. And they were still growing in their faith. And I think whenever we narrow our biblical vision into some national or racial or regional or even confessional church, haven't we reconstructed those walls? The detours from the journey no longer follow the one who placed the star in the sky. And I believe a way for us to find the path is to come out from behind the walls. You know, one of Reagan, and I'm not a Reaganomics fan, but one of his big saying was, tear those walls down. We can tell Gorbachev to tear the walls while we're building them here in America. Tear those walls down. We need to follow the leading of the one who placed the star in the sky. Matthew's inclusion of the wise men in the heart of this Christmas story, as he did the inclusion of women in the heart of his genealogy, shows us another way. That's what he's really trying to do, show you and me another way, a way of surmounting the barriers that would really you and I sometimes build and keep us from reaching out to each other. It's showing us another way. And this gift was far from, it was far more priceless. This gift of showing you and me another way was far more priceless than the frankincense, the gold, and the myrrh that they left. Herod was the old way. What are some old ways for you and me? 
The use of power and influence to dominate and destroy was the old way. Herod lived in a world that might was right. That was the old way. Herod, the three wise men was looking for another way. Force was used to intimidate others to follow one's desire. That's the old way. To react to the news by striking back, that's the old way. His way was one of violence. That's the old way. And, and by following the star, the three wise men would say, I want to show you a new way. After all, Herod is reported to have, this was, a, this was not a well man. Many scholars believe he suffered from mental illness. He, he killed three of his sons. One of his wives and the innocent of Bethlehem shivered that night when he destroyed the lives of children out of fear. I say, thank God there are no more Herods in the world, right? <laughs> The old way was one of living by labels. Labels. Someone asked me the other day, so are you Lutheran? I said, mm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a believer that worships in a Lutheran congregation. <laughs> labels. How easy it was, how easy for the wise men to follow the king's path. This is what the king says. This is what I'm going to do not only intimidated by his might, but by, by the confusing messages that he was sending, go and find out about this baby so I can come and worship the baby. How confusing the contrast must have been between the stable and the palace. Herod's in the palace. Jesus is in the stable. But they were wise enough that they chose a more excellent way. Let me close by saying, I, I think I looked at this story a little differently as I was preparing this message. And it just, it just hit me that I've been taking this story a little bit lightly. Because I think it took great courage for the three wise men to disobey the king of the land. I could fill in a whole lot there. It took great courage for these three wise men to disobey the king of the land, where they were foreign guests. They actually traveled with permission and visas as Herod marked, stamped in their passport. It took great courage to do that. Don't take your decision to try a new way lightly. It takes courage. It takes courage to say, I won't hate. <laughs> it takes courage to say, I won't discard someone because they're black or Asian or Jewish or transgender or gay, it takes courage, even in the church. And I tell you, some people won't understand. Some people, like Herod, will feel threatened. And sadly, some may even laugh. How tempted we are at times, as Stephen Carter suggested in his book, to make our faith a hobby, or at best, an interest group. But never dare let our faith show. I want you to chew on that for this week. I want to encourage you to continue your journey. For the wise men, there, were, there was a need to go back home. And for you and me, there's a need to go on. 
By being wise, we can make some right choices on which way to go. The challenge, though, wherever we are on our faith journey, and I don't know where you are, wherever you are on your faith pilgrimage, the challenge is to be open to following star and the one who put the star in the sky. Faith is not always knowing the whole way, but really being willing to seek and to follow God's guidance. And, and I, I, I'm not saying that's easy. <laughs> Just as the children of Israel follow the cloud by day and the fire by night, I, I pray for a faith to go the way God would have me to go and to love God the way God had me to love and to preach the way God would have me to preach and to teach the way God would have me to teach. I think I'm searching for wise ones. I'm trying every day to shut out the voices of the old ways. I'm trying every day to find a new path. Call to find a better way is also a call to not to stop too soon. When the wise men arrived in Jerusalem, they were only six miles from their goal. Six miles from their goal. But they still had a long way to go. They needed to stay focused and not really fall to the flattery of the king, not really confuse power with right. And just as they really keenly understood the star that others would have wondered about, they had to listen. They had to listen for the still small voice which told them to go on. They had to see the greatness in the small. They had to know the need in the move to go home. They had to see the importance of following through. And all of these things are things that you and I have to do. How ironic that these three outsiders were among the first to see and to find and to worship Jesus. Herod was near Bethlehem, but he couldn't take the step. The wise man had the wisdom to find and to follow the star and stay tuned to further orders. The first order was to go and see the child. The second one was to go home a different way. They weren't hiding behind the walls of pride or fear or even Herod. And my prayer, and I'm really closing with this, my prayer is that we never reduce our worship to a place where we are not open to going in a new direction. To respond to God's call. To find maybe a new way. To go another way. Not the way of the world. Not the way of power. Not the way of selfishness. But my prayer is that we would find a way to go God's way. And I'm not saying that's easy. (laughs) Let's pray. Going another way, God, we ask for the strength and the courage to follow not only the star, but follow the Almighty who placed the star in the sky. Amen. Do you feel the Christmas spirit?
<laughs> That's good. <laughs> Bow to babe on bended knee, Savior of humanity. Unto us a child is born, he shall reign forevermore. No. If I were French, I'd say merci beaucoup. If I were German, I'd say danke schön. If I were uh, Shanti, I'd say eche pupo or mot du pay. If I were deaf, I would say, but thank you for being here. Thank you for being out there in Zoom land. <laughs> thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your time. It, it's really, you are valued and you are valuable. And I don't take it lightly that you block out this period of time on Sunday evenings to join us via Zoom or to come here. And there, are, you know, this is California. We have multiple options. So thank you. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We say muchas gracias, merci beaucoup for all the blessings you pour into our life. And we thank you for a heart that is willing to give back um, a portion of the blessings of the time and the energy and the strength and the insight, whether we're giving it back in a classroom, whether we're giving back in a boardroom, 
whether we're giving it back as a doctor in a hospital or as an investment advisor, whether we're giving it back as we sing worship songs in this gathering or read a scripture or say a prayer or offer the greeting and the welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Not only for the gifts, but for heart to give back. As we come to prayer together, um, I'll lead, and then we'll have a chance to share with each other, and then we'll finish up with the Lord's Prayer together. So if you'll pray with me. God, I'm struck by how natural it is for us to want all those things that are the old way. Um, We've been taught to value security, and it's natural to feel threatened and to want to protect. And... God, this, I, I'm really struck by how deeply that goes. Um, in our financial lives, we're taught to be secure. Emotionally, we're told to put up boundaries. And, and God, I'm not saying that we should be reckless. Um, it's just that it seems like our highest value is stability and keeping things the way they are. And when we see the message of Jesus, that is not the message. That is not the highest value. So I pray that we would be more like the wise men. Um, And I'm struck by the fact that they were in a group, God, and I wonder what the dialogue would have been like between them. And if they were individually seeking that path, maybe they would have been tempted to go back even more. So I pray that we would have a communal faith, that we would confer with each other about what's wise, that when one of us has a dream, Uh, metaphorically or otherwise, about what we think we hear you saying, that we could talk to each other about that and get confirmation about what direction you're leading us. And then that we would have the courage to do so. It was a dangerous choice that they made. And we see through Jesus' life and Martin Luther King's life and all the other people who spoke truth to power, we see that that is not a popular um, thing to do and that when we don't go uh, with the main values of society, then it's uh, a disturbance to other people. God, I pray that we would see your ways as lovely enough, beautiful enough, satisfying enough that we would be willing to forego the old ways the ways of violence, the ways of self-satisfying, the ways of convention, and that instead we as a group and individually would find ways to love that are radical, that are fresh, um, that make a difference, that enliven, encourage. Help us to go that other way. Right. You might have things that you want to share with each other, whether those are concerns or praises. Um, and uh, just so that you know, just to make it clear that this part won't be recorded, recorded, excuse me, and so you know it won't be um, available for people to hear later on. So you can feel free to share things that are confidential, and what you say and what your tradition may be. so much. Our Father, Mother, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Try.
was like around that table that night as Jesus took bread, wanting to share this last meal with his disciples, knowing that this was kind of a foreshadow to the cross. You know, I'm eating with you now, but I'm going to offer my life for you in a few days. I wonder what was going on in the disciples' mind outside of what we read in the text, you know, the bickering around the table, is it I, is it I, all that. Yeah, I wonder what they were thinking. I wonder what we think when we come forward to receive communion. Oh, this is a nice symbolic gesture. This is a reminder of someone who really loves you. I mean, you're obviously free to your thoughts. I like to think of it as a love letter from Christ to me and from Christ to you. How much Christ loves you. Bread symbolizing his body. The wine symbolizing, well not wine, we use apple juice. The juice symbolizing um, the blood. Gifts for you. Communion. This is the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken and shed for you and me, give you the peace and the love and the grace and the courage that you need this week as you encounter those opportunities to go another way. Please join us in singing Alle Alleluia, and if you want to stand up and get your wiggles out, that's good too.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord God and especially one another. Two, three. Ale, alleluia. Ale, alleluia. Ale, alleluia. Ale, alleluia. Amen. Uh, we also have some snacks, so Naomi and I are going to go get them, okay?